Uh, Dean Florino, you've had a lot of experience in the legislative process. You've had several years' experience as a legislator in the California Assembly and a state controller for the state of California. And you've had an opportunity to watch various political officials as they try to influence the, the policy-making process. What are the characteristics of these political officials in attempting to influence the, the policy-making process? What makes an effective negotiator? Probably the most important basic criteria is credibility. For somebody within the legislature to attempt to negotiate uh, the progress of a piece of legislation, get the support he needs, the other members basically have to feel that the guy's word is good. If he says he's going to make a minor change here or there, then he'll do it. Uh, that it's worthwhile in that context at least discussing something with him because he, he has credibility uh, and he's believable and, uh, and, and his word, particularly his word, is good. And once you lose that, you've lost all capability to negotiate anything. And I've seen that happen on a couple of occasions where people have deliberately misled legislators and there's nothing uh, as violent as a reaction. Uh, to somebody who does that. Uh, it doesn't have anything after that to do with the substance of a proposal or, or anything else. Uh, it just has to do with the fact that you can't trust the guy. So I'd say that probably is a fundamental criteria of quality to, to begin negotiations. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not going to get very far. I think, secondly, you have to know what you're talking about uh, or you're not a good negotiator because you're going to you're going to have to know the subject matter, and you're going to have to be able to explain it to people how it affects different variety of circumstances. And you're going to have to accept the fact that in a legislative body particularly, it's absolutely impossible for everybody to know thoroughly all of the different subject matter fields on which they come to be asked to vote. And so many of the members will not be well informed. There tends to be the development of specialists really, people within the body who are recognized to have a significant in-depth base of information and knowledge about a particular subject matter area, and it's helpful if you're trying to negotiate in that subject matter area if you have that kind of standing. Some people know about social welfare, and I'll never know that much about social welfare. I tended to know more about education, and there were people who would come to me and ask me about bills and because they didn't understand what it meant and how it affected their district or, or whatever. And I don't think there's any substitute for that. Thirdly, in a legislative process, and it may sometimes replace number one and two, is power. <laughs> it helps to negotiate from power. I, I have never had the advantage of that, but I have seen how other qualities don't make much uh, of a dent if the power is lined up. You don't need to know what's in the bill. you got the power to put it through. Uh, you don't have to negotiate necessarily on the substance of the measure because uh, you basically can use other elements of the legislative environment to put together the coalition or get the support that you need to get it out so that uh, if a speaker is negotiating, he negotiates from a far different position than a member of a less than one-third minority well, who doesn't hold any positions of power within, within the legislative uh, body itself. Uh, I guess those, those are some of the, the key elements, uh, plus an, a willingness to recognize the fact that not everybody sees issues from the same position that you do and that uh, you may have to compromise some of the things mm -hmm. that are in the bill in order to get any of it at all and face frequently the difficult decision of whether what's left is worth doing. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned two things that I'd like to explore a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, the credibility and power. How do legislators or political officials develop credibility and power? Well, in the legislative body, when I was there, credibility wasn't difficult because uh, in, the, in the California state legislature, there were both uh, small bodies, uh, 80 members of the assembly and 40 members of the state senate. You got to know the members individually, socially, personally, uh, quite well. Uh, there was a lot of contact, not just in the in the house, but in extracurricular activities at dinners, and you know all the things that have become very suspect under all the new laws about what lobbyists can do and can't do. But there were a lot of occasions, uh, apart from voting on a bill or working on business, to get to know people and get to know them quite well. And so that that was one way. Uh, the other is within the process itself. Uh, I never will forget the. You know, in terms of credibility, the one instance that I remember very vividly was a fellow who brought a bill before the Education Committee, and the Education Committee 
after some discussion, agreed that they would report the bill out if he would amend it in a particular way. And I don't know, I don't even remember what the bill was about. And he agreed that he would amend it that way, and so he put the bill out due pass as amended, and then he brought it up on the floor without amending it. And when I find that out in the middle of the discussion, you know, I just uh, blew my cork and drew the attention of the other members to it, and we recommitted the bill to committee, and that's a, something that rarely happens, and it didn't really have anything to do with the legislation. It had to do with the fact that he had not done what he said he was going to do, and therefore, deep six it. Mm -hmm. And I never took that guy's word on anything again. How about power? Power? You get power within the organization of the legislature in terms of and it differs a lot in, in different places into where the institutional power resides. You take the assembly, the speaker of the assembly has a great deal of power so long as he's got 41 votes in the sense that uh, he appoints all the committees, he appoints all the committee chairmen, he assigns bills, and uh, he can have a very strong control over the flow of legislation. And that's apart from whatever political power he may have. Increasingly, in recent years, speakers have done a great deal within their own party to raise money and to support candidates and to help incumbents. So what the speaker giveth, uh, the speaker can take away. He has a lot of power in that regard. The state senate, in contrary, is, is not the same. The two institutions have changed quite a bit. When I first went to Sacramento, there was a group within the senate based on seniority that about 10 senators that really had the power because they controlled the organization of the uh, state senate and they had to end the assignment of bills as sort of a collegiate group. Uh, they had a committee over there called the Government Efficiency and Economy Committee, which was had no relationship to its jurisdiction, but any bill of any significance went to that committee and they dominated that committee and no bills got out of that committee that they didn't approve of and so they had a lot of power. Uh, today there isn't that same group uh, based on seniority. Their unique kind of seniority system has deteriorated uh, with the change from cross-filing and reapportionment and a lot of other things that have taken place. And so there's less concentrated power in the Senate organization uh, today, and it's kind of a more anarchic type place. You still, there are committee chairmen who have a preferential position as against uh, the ordinary member. But, uh, are there different sources of power now? I don't know that they are different sources of power within the institutional organization of the legislature itself. Uh, some have deteriorated, it's more, more dispersed in the Senate and more concentrated now than it used to be in the Assembly. But you get these changes in, in dynamics. Seniority, for instance, in the Congress used to be power. Just staying there a long time, you inevitably got to certain positions of power. But that's not necessarily true elsewhere. It's not true in the in, in California Assembly. You can be there a long time and not necessarily have power. But that, that all ignores all the peripheral aspects of power or influence that can be brought to bear through lobbyists, through Third House, as we call them in California, the... Uh, representatives of uh, all types of interests who are involved in the legislative process and have some ability to influence it depending on issues and stuff, as well as the parties and the organization of the parties vary so much from place to place uh, that it's hard to generalize. I mean, California, the, the organized political party doesn't really have much influence on the legislative process. The legislative party, I mean, the caucus within the assembly has more power now and influence than it used to have. The state party organization it doesn't exist. It's the party in the sense of influencing legislation really is the party uh, composed of the members that are there, the legislative party. Daly had a lot of power because of the political organization in Illinois it would have a lot more power in all aspects of the legislature in Springfield than say Tom Bradley would have in, just because he's a Democrat in Sacramento. That was the opening portion of my interview with Dr. Houston Flournoy, Dean of the Center for Public Affairs at the University of Southern California. Prior to his present position, Dean Flournoy was, for eight years, controller of the state of California and served six years as a legislator in the California State Assembly. We will return to our interview with Dr. Flournoy in a few minutes. However, we will use his opening comments to examine how negotiators develop leverage. What is negotiating leverage? 
A dictionary defines leverage as the increased means of accomplishing some purpose. As applied to negotiations, negotiators use leverage to maximize their advantage and success in negotiations. Leverage is the capacity to overcome the resistance and modify the conduct of the other negotiator. It is also the capacity to prevent our conduct from being modified to our disadvantage. Leverage, then, is the ability to influence, to have an impact on decisions and actions. Negotiators have leverage when they can make something happen in their favor. What are the sources of negotiating leverage? What types of leverage are used in negotiations? How is leverage built? The comments of our panelists on the characteristics of effective negotiators indicated many of the answers to these questions. Dean Flournoy stressed credibility, trust, expertise, and power, an ability to get to know people on a social basis, building a reputation for integrity, and being able to tap and control the institutional sources of power through gaining positions of formal authority and being able to bring political pressures to bear on other negotiators. In a previous cassette, Jack Anderson emphasized that negotiating skills are a key ingredient for leadership and that effective negotiators are personable. They have a way of winning people over. He also placed power high on the list of negotiating leverage, but power used gently and skillfully, not branding the big stick, having power but not being obvious about it. David Broder stressed expertise and the leverage of information, and why being seen as knowledgeable is a source of influence. Harlan Cleveland indicated that executives are increasingly dependent on other people over whom they have little control. As a result, they are faced with the challenge of how to get everybody in on the act, but still get some action. Consequently, negotiators and executives must be skilled in the leadership of equals and skilled in the consensus style of decision-making. Organizations must move from the formal bureaucratic way of doing business to a more decentralized democratic system in which things get done through increased participation. Underlying these dimensions of effective negotiators are three general ways for establishing and building negotiating leverage. These orientations for gaining leverage are rationality, psychological influence, and power. Briefly, rationality is leverage gained through knowledge, information, and facts. People are influenced and persuaded through logical arguments based on the facts. Houston Flournoy's comment about knowing your subject matter and being able to explain your position is an example of this type of leverage. David Broder's comment about legislative negotiations also points to this type of leverage when he said, the legislator who knows the bill the best will have the greatest amount of influence on whether or not it will pass. Another example, many scientists and technicians may not be at the higher ends of the organizational hierarchy, but they do have knowledge and information their superiors need. In effect, their expertise is leverage. The second type of leverage is psychological influence. People are influenced when they feel others understand and are empathetic with their feelings, values, and beliefs. Several of our panelists referred to credibility and integrity as characteristics of effective negotiators. Negotiators develop this leverage by being empathetic with and showing respect towards their adversaries. They know their adversaries in a non-business way. As Jack Anderson described effective negotiators, they can assail each other on the floor of Congress, but can still walk away arm in arm. Dr. Flournoy also emphasized the importance of getting to know the other negotiators socially, meeting with them informally to build this sense of trust and mutual respect. Power is the third type of leverage. The use of power is based on the assumption that people react only when threatened with various types of sanctions. Quite often this power is formal authority. 
Houston Flo and I mentioned the power of the Speaker of the California Assembly. He appoints committee chairmen and members. He assigns bills to various committees, and he controls the flow of legislation. But he also has political power. He raises campaign funds for other legislators. So as Houston indicated, what the Speaker giveth, the Speaker can take away. We will examine these three ways of building negotiating leverage and how they are used in the dynamics of negotiations. Our focus here will be the California State Assembly and the leverage used in legislative negotiations. But we'll also show that the same sources of leverage are used in other types of negotiations and in many ways in every aspect of our lives. These three types of leverage suggest why people change how they are influenced, and how they are persuaded. All of us use leverage to gain cooperation and support. As a result, we carry certain assumptions of which type of leverage is most effective in gaining that support from people, whether they be an opposing negotiator, other organizational members, or our family and friends. And although most of us tend to use a combination of these three types of leverage, we quite often lean more towards one of them. Which type of leverage we favor indicates what we believe is the best way of controlling other people's behavior. What kinds of control are legitimate and illegitimate? What types of behavior should be rewarded or punished? How people are motivated? And how conflict should be resolved? Therefore, our choice of leverage also has a direct impact on what type of negotiating strategy we will adopt, what types of bargaining and collaboration skills we'll use, and how we will deal with manipulation and intimidation. The assumptions underlying these three types of leverage are the foundation for the negotiating strategies and skills we will examine throughout this program. Consequently, it's important for each of us to examine our own assumptions on how we gain and use leverage, and whether or not we have the flexibility to use different types of leverage depending on what's most appropriate and effective. Now let's examine these three types of leverage in depth and how they are used to influence and gain advantage in negotiations. There are strengths and limitations in getting things done through people, and in getting people to cooperate with us. First, rationality is leverage. People are persuaded through logical arguments based on facts and when there is a logical way of doing something. This approach assumes people are rational and guided by reason and that an adversary can be persuaded by educating him. This knowledge and information will allow him to make better use of his reasoning abilities. Again, a negotiator using this approach sees people as logical. People are influenced to change their position or behavior when presented with new information or new evidence on ways of doing things. Little concern is paid to the emotional side of people's behavior. Instead, the negotiator tries to locate and correct information gaps and faulty reasoning. Our educational system is based on these assumptions. Education is seen as a way of spreading research to encourage reason and social change based on factual evidence. Negotiators use rationality in preparing for a bargaining session. They research the facts of the dispute. They find out what the economic realities are of a proposed transaction. They will look at cost of living indices, economic trends, and other data to establish a negotiating strategy. These facts and data will also be used to persuade the other party during bargaining, in essence saying, the facts support our position. Fact-finding in labor management negotiations is another example. A neutral fact-finding board holds hearings to determine the facts of the dispute. The board's assessment of the facts are shared with the two parties in the hope that the clarification of the facts will facilitate agreement. At the bargaining table, being able to present logical arguments is a form of leverage, whether this be verbally or visually through reports, charts, and statistics. 
Technical skill in writing contract language is another way of building leverage. Recall Mr. Joseph Gentile's comment in the second cassette. Negotiating leverage is built through the skillful use of language in writing the agreement. How words are put together will determine their meaning. In organizations, decision-making is rationalized through the organization structure. The structure specifies roles and responsibilities, establishes formal lines of communication and standard operating procedures, all of which are designed to make decision-making as rational and orderly as possible. In essence, what structure does is reduce ambiguity and increase predictability and stability. If conflict occurs, it is resolved through reference to rules, procedures, and standards. So knowledge of the formal rules and how things should be done is a type of leverage. Knowing what forms must be signed, whose approval is needed, and what legal requirements must be met are ways of building leverage. Another example of leverage gained through rationality is the use of systems analysis and operations research techniques. These two are designed to increase the logical and factual basis of decision making. In recent years, there has been an increasing use of these techniques to strengthen decision making in organizations and in legislative bodies. However, there are some limits on the use of these techniques in rationalizing decision making. And these limits also suggest some of the constraints on the use of rationality in other types of negotiations. First, sometimes it is difficult to identify and formulate the problem itself. Quite often what is stated as a problem is only a symptom of the real problem. As a result, controversy develops over what the problem is, a question that can't be resolved by analytical techniques or logical thinking. A second limit on making rational choices. Many problems are so complex that information to analyze how to deal with these problems is simply just not available. And when there is information, the time and cost to obtain and analyze it is often not feasible. A third limit. Many issues present value dilemmas which cannot be empirically tested. And quite often, two decision makers face a problem based on different values and philosophical preferences. Since there isn't any way to validate the truth of any value, some values have to be sacrificed to achieve others. At this point in a conflict, analysis can't be very helpful. A fourth and final limit is that people are often resistant to listening to the facts. Perhaps they find it easier to feel than to think. Perhaps they have strong value convictions where no amount of logic can change their minds. Perhaps they are frustrated by the bombardment of different conclusions based on an analysis of the same facts. And perhaps irrationality on their part serves their purpose. In any case, people do reject rational thinking and logical arguments. And as a result, other types of leverage must be used in negotiations. An example of these limitations was described by Harlan Cleveland. He found that in testifying before congressional committees, facts, figures, and charts often threatened or turned off the legislators. What was more useful, he found, was the rapport between himself and the committee members, their personal relationship. Recall his story of the county agent who, when testifying on a foreign aid bill, showed the legislators how, with a handful of seed corn, he developed a whole broom industry in Burma. That testimony got the bill passed because the legislators could relate to the agent's example based on their own experiences in growing up on farms. That is an example where psychological influence served as leverage in convincing the legislators. This leads us into the question of what types of leverage are used when the facts or logical arguments aren't enough for one negotiator to convince another. Before we examine psychological influence and power as types of negotiating leverage, let's return to our interview with Dean Flournoy. 
He gives us examples of the three types of leverage used in the negotiations within the California State Assembly. In particular, he describes how rules and procedures impact which bills are considered and passed, how clarifying the intent of a bill to other legislators is used to gain their support, and how legislators negotiate with each other on a personal needs basis, and as a result develop a sense of trust and reciprocity. Are there any rules that are followed that set up the process of negotiating a policy decision? The rules will have a big influence. I think probably the best way to give you some idea of the variety is to sort of contrast uh, California with Congress, although Congress is changing some. I mean, the rules allocate the power. And in the, as I've said, in the state assembly, the power is concentrated. But on the other hand, the members have more control over le their own legislation in Sacramento than they do in the Congress, where the committee tends to have the control over, over legislation. And this, there's been a, a tradition developed, it's one of those informal practices, that in Sacramento, uh, any legislator who introduces a bill has a, a right, essentially, to have that bill heard. Now, the hearing may be 30 seconds, but he's got a right to have that matter considered by the committee to which it's been referred. And it is his property, in a sense. Uh, if you put a bill in and it's reported out, uh, you bring it up on the floor, uh, you take it to the other house. If it passes, you present it to committee over there, and, and you have control over amendments or no amendments, and you get somebody uh, that you want to take it up on the floor of the Senate. Well, that's not the same kind of a procedure, really, in Washington, where the committees have had much more control over legislation. The chairmen have had the control over the committees to a far greater degree than was ever true in Sacramento. And uh, that's changing some with the changing seniority rules that the Democrats have adopted and the bigger role of the caucus. Seniority didn't automatically allocate chairmanships anymore, uh, but when it did, those committee chairmen were, uh, you know, like princes. I mean, they had a committee, they controlled legislation, nothing went out of that committee that they didn't want. What they thought about the substance of legislation didn't necessarily coincide with what anybody else thought about the substance of legislation. So they, were, they had a lot of power in that regard. And the committees still do in Washington, far more than they do in Sacramento in terms of controlling legislation. And, and there's a large, more prevalent practice of putting committee bills together, taking all the proposals that may affect an area, writing their own bill, having the committee chairman basically preempt that area of legislation and, and take it forward. Dean Florida, these are the former rules. Those are, yeah, those are the rules that, that set up this distribution of power. Are there any informal rules that have developed by way of practice? Well, I think in terms of the negotiation process in legislation, uh, these rules bring about the fact that in, in many ways negotiation takes place on a one-by-one one one basis. In other words, you, if you have a bill in the legislature, uh, you talk to the members of the committee you negotiate one to one, you don't just go talk to the chairman, you gotta have enough votes in Sacramento uh, to get it out. And you have that opportunity to get a vote. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it'll be taken. And if it goes to the floor, just because it's your bill, you still gotta round up the votes. So there's, it doesn't take place necessarily in a many faceted ar arena. It's a, it's a dialogue with, with, with a lot of different people. Now, other kinds of legislation, uh, the negotiation may be a more widespread in terms of the intrusion of interested parties, people who are either supporting your bill or opposing your bill. They're not members of the legislature, but they're, they're special interest groups, and, and I don't use that in a pejorative sense. I mean, they, they have an interest, and they're organized, and they're represented, and they're therefore against you. And sometimes uh, you negotiate a bill with them. You've got enough combination of the strong influences on the legislature that you know you can't get the bill passed the way it is. You you may try to figure out, talk to them to find out how you can get rid of their opposition, which means if you can get rid of their opposition, you may get, may get rid of the opposition of some of the members and, and get their support. They may do it for you. I mean, you may have people who are supporting your bill who are talking to people who are opposing your bill, trying to figure out how they can work out their differences and then bring it back. What are some methods that are used to gain support for a bill or to minimize the opposition? Well, 
One of the best ways to minimize the opposition, at least, is to try and talk to the people who are opposed to your bill and find out why they're opposed to it. And free, because frequently in legislation, as with a lot of other things, uh, you find you have unintended consequences. I mean, you didn't really mean to do the, well, something that uh, somebody comes and points out to you, God, this is a terrible bill because it's going to do this to me. And if that wasn't what you had in mind and it is an important to objective, uh, make sure you don't do it. I mean, cut down the unnecessary areas of, of opposition uh, that are irrelevant to the purpose of your policy. And I don't care how well you draft a bill, uh, the way life is, uh, and we do it all the time. You, you frequently do something you never intended to do. <laughs> and uh, the third house, the special interest representation, that's one of the great services they perform is to bring the attention sure. of legislators, uh, the fact they're doing something that uh, they really didn't mean to do, and to straighten out the bill before it gets on the law books. Mm -hmm. And uh, th that's a cardinal service. Uh, so that's that's one way. And the other way is, of course, is to round up the the people who are in support of them, have them work on the on your colleagues. What are some ways in which they do that? Well, they can talk to them, provide the arguments, provide the information. Maybe a bill you're not as well informed, you're not a specialist in it, or something. And, they can develop that kind of thing. Uh, they, once you get to outside the internal negotiations, you know, there's 101 ways to try to do it, uh, to go to people in the district, to get to the newspapers. I mean, you can conduct a campaign out there to build support. How about trade-offs or compromises uh, within the legislature? You can do that, too, occasionally. Uh, some people will do that. Uh, one of the best ways on, on state legislation, and one of the things I think that people don't understand frequently is that not all bills are terribly important. They may be to somebody, but uh, you know they're not all burning issues that have the the public in, in flames. Uh, they really uh, don't uh, do much, but they whatever they do something that's important to whoever wants the bill uh, and whoever is proposed. You used to be able to negotiate anyway in Sacramento on a personal basis uh, with with your friends saying, "Got it." I need the bill. This is a good bill for my district. I got to have it. Will you give me a vote? Or will you vote it out of committee for me? I, I mean, give me the vote to get it out, and I don't care if you vote for it on the floor. Or... How do legislators develop this access to other legislators and develop uh, this type of trust and reciprocity? You know, it's, it's easy in a small body. I think the House of Representatives is a far more difficult place because you got 435 of them running around from all over the country. and. I think it's much more difficult to do that. To do it in certain certain parts by experience, by watching people, getting to know many of them. In Sacramento, you, you knew them all, and you knew them all pretty good. Uh, and a lot of it, the knowledge, came you know comes from feel, subjective judgments about people that uh, may arise from uh, from social what type, interchange. What type of subjective judgments? Uh? Well, that he's a decent guy. The, the guy is, I may not agree with him on everything, but, uh, you know, he's got his head screwed on right, and he's, he's sincere in what he's trying to do, and uh, he's not uh, just playing games and, back, and promoting his own credibility. Right. right. You know, that, uh, that of course, is, was my, my standard. Uh, you can apply any standard you want to, but uh, uh, I could get along fine with people I thought were sincerely trying to do something they thought was worthwhile, whether I did or not, and I might oppose them I think they were wrong, but that isn't, uh, you know, being being a political opponent is not the same thing as being an opponent. And that happens all the time. If you you develop respect for people, even though you may not uh, support them. The arguments and conflicts that take place in the legislative process are not personalized? Is that They're not accurate? personalized, no, sir. And that's sort of one of the rules of the game. Sometimes they get that way. You know, I had a guy once called me the, on a public forum, said that I was a tool of the corporate interests in a tax matter, and then he came over afterwards and said that's nothing personal. Well, I, I, <laughs> that's a dichotomy that I don't understand. Uh, you know, if he says I'm wrong, it's okay, fine. Uh, you may think the, the tax is justified or the tax is not justified, uh, and you've got an equal right, and that's one of the fundamental aspects of it. Every member of the legislature has an equal right to believe whatever they want to believe. I mean. We're not responsible for their being there. The people sent them there from their district, and his vote's just as good as my vote. 
And his view is just as good as my view, whether I think it's wrong or not. So, and plus, if you ever want to get anything passed, you, you've got, can't get mad at everybody because you, there's always another issue, there's always another roll call, and you want, maybe you'll agree on the next one. And you may be working with him on one thing and fighting him like the devil on something else. But uh, it's, it's not a matter of, of personal, except sometimes people do have personal animosities that develop usually from personal aspersions, mm. not from political or policy consequences. What are some of the key persuasion skills that you've witnessed amongst uh, legislators? The most persuasive thing with most legislators is that it's not going to hurt them in their district. I mean, if you've got a proposal and you can persuade them that this is going to hurt them in their district, mm -hmm. then uh, they're going to listen to you. There are some proposals that the contrary is true. I mean, there's some legislators on some issues, and there's no point even talking to them because you know that uh, they can't possibly support you because of what it'll do to their district. In California, school finance was always one of those issues. A good illustration. Of that. It wasn't any good to talk to the people from San Francisco about more state money uh, to less wealthy school districts uh, if you had to take it away from the wealthy school districts to get it, because San Francisco is, in, in that sense, a wealthy school district, and any proposal I ever put in for that, I always, regardless of party, <laughs> I always took it on the chin from San Francisco guys, because they were fighting to protect their district. And that's another thing you learn to understand in the legislative process. You can't ask a guy to commit political suicide for your bill. I mean, there are some bills, and you, I mean, and it was a common practice at the, in those days to even tell your friends, uh, you know, when they come up and ask you, can I vote for this bill, and I, is it a good bill? And I say, yeah, it's a good bill, but you can't possibly vote for it in your huh. district. <laughs> Is that right? You it's usually that, say that, that to your friends, and usually when you got more than enough votes to pass it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, there was a recognition that, uh, you did, again, if he asked you, you couldn't mislead him. You couldn't say, nah, either your district will love this when you know he's cutting his own throat. The next because time. the next time it's all over, you're through. And that's part of that credibility business. Hmm. What happens uh, under severe conflicts? How do negotiators or legislators negotiate when there are some really deep divided differences between them on a piece of legislation. Rarely do you get the kind of circumstance that you're talking about where you negotiate. Now you can negotiate, most of those kinds of conflicts would be conflicts between the houses uh, or in, that would be worked out in, in conference committee somehow. Not too many people are involved in those kind of negotiations. I mean, if it's a really major big thing, it'll be the leadership. The Speaker of the Assembly will be negotiating it with uh, maybe the leadership of the uh, minority who's opposing it. So if it's a highly visible issue? The more visible the issue, the harder it is to negotiate. And usually then the, the process of negotiation is left, left up to the It'll key, be worked key out between the, the, the leadership of the committee where it's in trouble and the author, or the leadership of the house where it's in trouble and the author, uh, or the people who are visibly the leaders, leaders of the opponents in, in a situation where they've got enough votes to, to stop you. You don't negotiate if you're going to win.